to uh, introduce our guest today, not that he needs any introduction, but uh, thank you, Jerry, so much for, for accepting the invitation and being very generous uh, as always. Um, Jerry is a professor of typography at the University of Reading, UK. He is the program director for three master programs on type design and typography. Two of these programs together with the TDI summer course are globally first and discipline leaders. And I would like to add just uh, a very quick thing that, that uh, Jerry is, is an absolute inspiration for me uh, for so many years and I'm sure many to come. Um, and I'm super excited for our conversation today. That is terrible. This is so much pressure. <laughs> no, no there is there's no pressure. This is this is little of what you deserve, honestly. Like yeah. we we can talk a lot about what you did and what you do for this practice, but I am very curious to get in. And I, I would like to start actually from your words, which were very inspiring to me personally to start this whole. Uh, platform and to take this mm. research I'm working on to, to an open way. So I will start by reading um, the first like couple lines in the foreword in theory of type design. Uh, and it says, we can evaluate the maturity of a field of knowledge by considering four questions. First, are the boundaries of its focus and consequently its positioning and relationships with other fields clear and well understood? Second, is there a body of knowledge that is accepted as a foundational for as a as foundational for all activities for all activity by the community active in the field? Third, are there established routes for learning and practicing in the field? And fourth. Are there established paths for research, reflection, knowledge generation, and correction in the field? I could not find a better intro than reading these lines, to be honest, because I think it will just open a lot of what we want to talk about today. Uh, I'm glad you that you remind me of these i have to say sometimes i get quoted back to myself and i cringe because i'm thinking ah, i should have said it differently no, no. Uh, but perhaps this uh this attitude also shows that our discipline is quite new and we are really just building the foundations uh, I can find parallels with a lot of other disciplines in the humanities where they were maybe 100 and 120 years ago when people were first beginning to say, what is this thing that we call, I don't know, linguistics or anthropology or ethnography and so on. And uh, it might have to do with these areas of people saying, are we a separate discipline? No, maybe we're not. Maybe all of this is a joke and we're just, just some sort of craft that uh, has some people have the luxury of talking about it. Uh, but the more I think I learn about typography, the more I realize that it is a discipline of its own that has deep foundations. And increasingly, I am convinced that it's one of the best entry points to understanding the complexity of cultures. And I focus specifically on cultures because I don't want to talk about just languages or identities and so on, but something that is quite complex and dynamic. Uh, and that is uh, quite true of a lot of substantial disciplines in humanities. Historians have for a long time now not needed to convince anyone that we need historians. History is constantly being rewritten as we discover new ways of interpreting sources as we uncover new ways of retelling our narratives. The whole movement of rethinking this, this Western bias of historical narratives is very much proof of this. And we don't question it. We're saying, yes, it's a good thing that we actually ask questions about our sources. So then the same thing applies to something as complex as typography. But we have not yet, I think, built enough common understanding of how do we do this? Okay, if I say that typography is actually a very useful lens, how do I do this? You know, your, your nice background has some metal type behind it 
That means histories of technology, histories of labor, histories of resources, of finances, of trade, of empire, of politics, of everything. And yeah. somewhere in there also there is design, but I see design as maybe on the pyramid, the top of the pyramid of all of these things. And I don't think you can do typography. Just I'm just going to look at how little shapes look. I think you're just missing all of these other elements that say, I cannot understand all this discussion about national identity and type. What is a nation, first of all? Is a nation something that is congruent with a state? Is it something that has to do with communities of language or religion or geography? How do I deal with issues that have to do with diasporas and so on? These things are complex. Yeah. And my attitude maybe is that it's a discipline that requires people to slow down, to, to think, to reflect, to, to read, question everything that we read, and then contribute little perspectives into a very uh, quickly growing narrative. I think in 50 years, this will all seem trivial because we will have perhaps arrived at a position where typography is a discipline that is awarded the the respect it requires because it is one of the best lenses of national identity, of community identity, of cultural identities and so on, and ways of telling this and revising this. Uh, this is not an issue in architecture. Yeah. People discuss architecture as something, for example, I can look at the mid 20th century building of grand buildings in, uh, in the Indian subcontinent, and there are issues of post-colonial ideas of nation building there. Same thing in South America in the 19th century. I and mean, that's already framed in a very well-established narrative, uh, which is the basis for the discussion. The same thing happens in typeface design exactly, and typography. Yes. Uh, yeah. The fact that you know, very few communities have the resources to sit around the table and say, let's invent a typesetting system. That's just not feasible. And you might have wanted to do it. You can't do it because you just can't get the resources to do it. And there is vest investment to do it. It's easier to go and import something. Yeah. The only culture that has done it is China, simply because of the scale of the, the economy and the isol self-isolation of, exactly, yeah. of the country. And to some degree, Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody else has to deal with something that was invented for something else and then adapt it. Okay, that is normal expediency of doing something that is okay or good enough rather than perfect. But that has a lot of narratives, it has agency, it has different stakeholders who make decisions. They are rarely typographers or designers. Uh, they are publishers, they are politicians, they are business persons, whatever. And unless we see those perspectives, we're, we're just missing the point. Yeah. So a lot of the conversation uh, also that happens by people online who feel, who feel the frustration that they say, oh, hold on, uh, I am Chinese. Why does uh, this interface speak to me in English? Yes, yeah? yes. I, am, I speak in Arabic, in Persian, and I can see that half of my interface goes right to left, but actually the template is left to right. You know, it's only half adapted to my script that's a good starting point but then unless you work backwards and say how is this thing made how does it reach to me who is me that this is reaches uh, do i represent a market did somebody extract value from providing this to me and so on and my values also are reflect in how i speak i have a sort of let's say, left of center approach to history in this, but I think we need to understand that decisions that are made that influence typography are done for large groups of readers. Uh, they are done for people who have the capability to add value to processes that generate value for someone. And that happens if you're making a typesetting system. It also happens if you're making an education program in a university or in a school. It is no accident that we have tons of short courses on typeface design now, uh, and we didn't have them 20 years ago. 
uh, not because people were not smart enough to come up with the idea. It's the simple that people who are smart enough to think of it realize there isn't a market yet. Mm. It's just not worthwhile for us to do it. So I think we, we have to be aware that regardless of politics, the concept of a market and sort of demand and supply something that works from both sides. I might want to have a, a purview of typography that is global in its scope. Well, it's no secret that in 99, 2000, when we started shifting the type design program and say, this is Fiona, a global scope program, we were told we give you two years. Okay. Because people thought that's not a thing. No, this is going to fail. <laughs> and may, maybe it would have. Maybe if you had done it five years earlier, I think it would have probably failed because maybe there wouldn't have been the right kind of market, the right kind of demand of people. We wouldn't have reached the right kind of people who would make that investment at risk. And then it starts. And 10 years later with a short course, again, a similar thing happens that I think we were lucky in capturing an audience of educators at the time. Uh, and I think that indeed what about 12, 13 years ago was uh, a turning point in education where enough people who were teaching were appreciating the requirements for some kind of research activity. Yeah. Uh, to de design as something that is informed by research. And though I need to have the mental toolkit to do this, you know, if I'm 35 years old and I'm teaching, I cannot actually take a year out to go and, but maybe I can take two weeks out to go and do something and begin to learn something. So uh, that shows us how we might have a, a wealth of ideas and motivations, but they need to come at the right time for the right people. And then they gradually build into a critical mass where now for educators to try to build a research profile to understand what is research is nothing new. Yeah. Uh, and we similarly see people who are educators around the world uh, making propositions about research in local archives that really 20 years ago would have been impossible to imagine. Uh, not because the archives were not there, but if you went to the relevant archivists and you said, oh, I'm looking at things from a typeface design point of view, they would look at you as you had landed from the moon, <laughs> which yeah. to many levels still happens in many places, but gradually less so. Yeah. Uh, and that brings the my monologue, my opening monologue to the subject of the title we agreed for this. Uh, and I say this speaking from, I, I describe my perspective as a perspective of moderate otherness. Um, because in many of the circles I move in, I am majoritarian in my views, but equally I am also a minority that sees, I'm, I've been for nearly 30 years in a country where I always sound different, I look different and my way of doing things is different. So I'm aware of these kind of conditions, uh, but I am uh, very much appreciative of the privilege of me first to actually be able to spend time with motivated people doing this thing at a sustained length of time. Yeah. Uh, and also of the privilege in the people that actually make it to, to Reading to be able to spend that time there. So they themselves, with all love and respect to all of them, uh, apart from those who've ha had the benefit of substantial scholarships, most of them also embody some kind of privilege from family or personal success or whatever that allows them to give themselves this opportunity. Yes. Uh, exactly. And for me, while this is, it's good, because it creates a, it's a small, uh, like a small startup environment. It, it allows you to bring a lot of very motivated, intelligent people together. And that has a lot of synergies. It is also something that doesn't scale. And that has been on my mind for about 20 years now that this is not a way forward. Uh, it's good for this to exist as a laboratory for things, but really we need different ways of developing 
resources that are accessible to people, uh, formats for people to come together and so on. We open the conversation with lamenting the fact that we don't meet. Uh, so something that has been very much on my mind is how do people who represent this kind of privilege, like myself, because I'm essentially being paid to think about that stuff, hopefully, uh, and also people who have the opportunity to produce research, to produce uh, bodies of knowledge that can be useful to others, can then transmit this process to communities that don't have that opportunity. And sometimes I joke that my, my career objective uh, would be for whatever Reading stands for in typeface design, by the time I retire, to be completely unexceptional, to be entirely uninteresting, just one of you know, 180 places around the world where people are doing similar things. If it continues to be something that is worth talking about as different, then myself and we all have failed uh, because then we will not have built in place the processes that allow local communities to develop this. And I think very much we are at a turning point. I can see a lot of uh, communities uh, in countries where there is, I, I have to be a little bit careful, I think, but I think it's a generation of 30 somethings and 40 somethings people who have grown up in a more digital connected environment, people who are seeing building their careers uh, as part of a wider network, rather than just long, not that there aren't enlightened 50 something, 60 something and so on. <laughs> uh, but I think that there's a critical mass of people in the younger generation who can take a risk in building things that are global rather than just regional. Uh, so Places in India, in uh, Sri Lanka, in Thailand, uh, slowly in Malaysia, uh, in China, you see people who are actually quite active in thinking of their practice as something that shares methodologies and ways of thinking about the discipline that are not just local, they're not national. And that immediately raises the issue of, well, how do I do this thing with others with whom I cannot be easily yeah. with? that then raises issues of how do we share terminology how do we share resources what language do we do this in how do we use this weird tool that is english and which exactly <laughs> it is for us it's a second language so we use this uh, this sort of avatar for <laughs> common communication that is this this very flexible uh, global vo version of english that serves as an intermediary for us to be able to, that's fine. I have no guilt about this because it's a second language for me. So I, I bear none of the Northern guilt of using English in my communication. Uh, but until I have something that allows us to have one-to-one, -one, so I can speak from Greek to Arabic or from Greek to Persian directly, uh, then I'm happy to use this intermediate stage where, okay, I'll piggyback through English to get to it, uh, because maybe this will allow other people also to use it as a connection for others. So if I'm doing something from English to, from English to Arabic, then maybe it will help someone to do it with Persian and so on. Yeah. Uh, there, that uh, connects also to the problem of building platforms uh, that are, for what of a better word, as accessible, as cheap, as fluid as possible. Uh, because we grew up, we sort of, my generation of people in this field grew up in the space of large international uh, conferences and organizations that are very expensive. Uh, and yes, it's wonderful to be in another country, but it means you need to fly. Yeah, they get, for many people, it means you need to get a visa, which might not be necessarily straightforward. Yeah. Uh, and they're very big organizations. Uh, you know, the conferences are very expensive. They're into six digits. You know. And I say this having been through it um, through my many years of work at ATIPI. And I think while, again, these things are useful because they offer a different level of exposure to ideas, they shouldn't be the only thing. And we shouldn't just also have just local events that are happening. 
uh, we need something that bridges the two. Uh, what I mean, it feels like prehistory now because of COVID, but uh, mm -hmm. shortly before COVID, we were able to run working seminars, which was originally an ATIPI format from the 70s. But the idea for something that is small and local and flexible. Uh, the first one was in Colombo. For me, it was really important that that would happen in uh, an environment where there is a very strong local community interested in type design and typography uh, without the very long tradition of doing things. Uh, but there are people like uh, Sumantri Samaravikrama and Pathume Gotavata who coordinate activities, uh, do exhibitions, do collections-based resources, uh, research, uh, to show that uh, there is a way of doing events that can be uh, helpful to regional communities, local communities, but also leave a record that can then be taken on by others. Uh, I think that was a very good uh, testing of ideas. I think we learned a lot. I am more hopeful of taking a format and separating it essentially from any specific um, say body essentially, especially a body that is based in the West and doing something that is entirely driven by communities. Um, I'm going to plug an event that has not hit the public sphere yet. It's called Typo Diversity uh, and it is organized uh, with uh, a wonderful group of people from Toronto with a Persian connection. Nice. So uh, this will hopefully happen in Mar March, March next year, I think March. Oh. Um, but the idea there is uh, to have simultaneous translation for everything. So instead of uh, giving some primacy to one language and just say, oh, you can also t talk in your native language, that's not very useful for me. Uh, if you're speaking in Persian and I want to know what you hear, I can't wait uh for whenever someone might translate it so we thought okay how do we do this from start so sp people speak in their native language but then we have recordings that get translated and subtitled at the time that they go out and then we plan all discussions so that there is some sort of simultaneous translation uh we're doing it very slowly and carefully in a very small scale because we haven't done anything like this before and I guess it has to be cheap. You know, it's on everybody's weekend time. Uh, but the idea is to see, can we do without major sponsors, without you know, big money involved and so on, something that is properly balanced in terms of the contributing languages and open. And then we can say, this is what we learned from this. This is what worked well, this is what didn't work well and do everything publicly. Uh, and then let other people do their own versions of things. Yeah, you know, to start creating these little hubs of activity uh, that are uh, open to multiple languages owned by default. Uh, I say this aware that some online platform like YouTube and so on will allow live transcription. Uh, and I think, yeah, but that works okay live only for English. Uh, if there for, is yeah, not for, yeah, other, uh, not for other languages. So yeah. again, that's not very good for me. Uh, if there is automatic transcription, at least for other languages, which there is in a lot of systems, why can it not be built into those platforms? Yeah. So that then at least we can use it as a starting point. Uh, and I am talking very consciously from things that are Europe and eastwards, uh, because I, th again, I betray my views on this, and I know that there's some people from uh, North Americas there. Uh, so, with all my love and greetings to them, but uh, Europe is a small, very complicated historically region, uh, and I think despite what snapshot, historical snapshot we live in, I think the, the multicultural uh, reality is very much embedded, uh, especially in what is Central Europe now, Southern Europe, uh, 
people that look and listen and sound very differently is part of our normal realities if we look at a little bit longer than just our own childhood yeah uh, and the further east we go the more this is so uh, and i think that a lot of the rhetoric and the the old canonical western histories belie this they hide what is in reality an extremely rich uh, experience that is very multicultural um, I see some people here who are from uh, from Turkey and so on. The, the, the whole Byzantine experience, Turkish lands experience is one of intense multiculturalism, uh, the whole of the East Mediterranean as well, further east too. Uh, I'm not even going into the Indian subcontinent, which we cannot be really seen in any other terms as, an, as a melting pot of different influences and cultures. Uh, and I think this, reality is something that is uh, one of the greatest challenges in the histories we read where people would just say oh this is how things were well no this is a snapshot of maybe a specific history a specific viewpoint and the requirement to give a linear and clear story to what you're saying forces you to flatten a lot of things but the reality on the ground is very different so i think our default position our default historical experience is one of uh, overlapping layers of identity, multiculturalism that exists on the ground together, yeah. uh, rather than the clear uh, and I think often imposed from above stories that are very simple. Uh, so, in in a way, we have to be aware of this uh, and be aware that whatever we replace the histories that we are taking apart now cannot be oh, I'm replacing, say, Morrison with a typographic history written by another guy who is darker. That is just not very helpful because those histories are very linear and sort of almost monocultural. What I want is something that represents typographic retelling as narratives as something that is a network of influences of overlapping uh, factors that are very dynamic and embody multiple perspectives at the same time. I think this is much more difficult. Yeah. I have to say, it is way easier to write one of the histories that is, say, a British perspective from 1930. Yes, in all fairness, the resources you have at your disposal are much fewer, and there are parts of the world that are entirely inaccessible to you, so fair enough to some degree. I cannot use these excuses. But if I say, oh, I want to note down how I think typography merges into consciousness, into a community, I cannot say I'm writing about Britain or France or Italy or Greece or Egypt uh, or Turkey. I have to try to take the whole of my conscience yeah. into space. And that's extremely difficult. And to a large degree, that is why I think more useful texts are not appearing very much simply because of the complexity of the problem and we tend to see a lot of writing that is more focused on case studies or smaller problems and so on uh, but from these little steps where people are writing about challenges of harmonization of trying to understand what is a language what's a culture what's the relation between a language and a script uh, that kind of stuff in a way that's understood more gently is the starting point. Okay. Um, we are back and everyone is back and we're recording again. So uh, everything should be good. Okay. Uh, Before we start, I have some, can I drop a little plug for Type Calculate? Uh, sure. Who are doing online events. They, I think they managed only to do one in-person event and they drop, and this is a good example of something that is initiated by people on the ground in a way, and they flexibly adapted to doing things online. They're doing yeah. these online interviews and so on. I think they've got an event tomorrow or next, uh, next week. Uh, I can also drop a link for them. I participated <laughs> with them before in a, <laughs> in a discussion also, and they, they occasionally do... Uh, I'll 
share a link for it in the, in the chat. For Thank you. Me. Yes, sure. Um, you you really like in in um, in your words you touch it with a lot a lot of points that I was already uh, like had them ready here to discuss with you, and I'm very glad that when you when you were talking about your position at trading and everyone at trading you started from the point of understanding the privilege of this position the privilege of being in such an institute to be offered such environment to to work and and uh, 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 for yourself and from every for everyone for the students at training and so on but it's good also that for starting from this point of uh, understanding the privilege is to understand the responsibility that comes with it as in how can we give back to the community around uh, in, in this discipline that is not having the same privilege or not having the same uh, access for me personally, like um, I, I am a self-taught type designer. Um, right now, I'm working at, at my uh, on my on my masters at Sandberg, but and that's a, a privilege. But as a start, my only accessibility to the community was the conferences. Was to to go to one of the conferences, get to meet you, get to see what everyone is actually working on. What is this body of research everyone is, is trying to work on and share with, with everyone else? But it, it only when I started to get in, a, in a, a very focused research phase that I started to really understand the weight and the responsibility of what I'm doing as a type designer. There was already a, a responsibility coming from how many people am I designing this for? Like I, I started working on, I would start working on a project for, for Google Fonts and then I'm like, ah, this will be for so many people. I have to take this seriously. But once you start really digging into understanding the history of the development here, what happened and see how it takes you from like colonial history to like uh, how societies lived, how this like uh, king or sultan used <laughs> Uh, calligraphy or type uh, or manuscript skills to to emphasize like a certain image of himself and so on through the history that reading and 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 having this understanding of the history of the practice itself really no gives me a complete different understanding of the responsibility of the mm -hmm. practice like now I feel like I really want to take things more seriously. Like I, I feel more pressure. I feel, I feel more um, responsibility, as I said. And I believe now time is, 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 if we're going to talk about Arabic script especially, it's very important point in its development to take a pause and, and to look around and to start to understand what really needs to be done. In my opinion, at least. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that and I see this this conversation open in, in something like the the, the manifesto released by uh, Christian Sarkis, calling for using manuscripts as a source of information. But and and I completely understand with this idea and, and understanding where we are coming from to understand where where we should be heading towards. But this highlights the status of of the archives the accessibility of it, the, the research that was done by others before us and the accessibility of it. And I see a lot of amazing work coming out of Reading. Like I, I see, let alone only the, the PhD of Titus, that's, that's an amazing work. Like that's an amazing body of work. And it was the first thing, like when I came to Sandberg, the first thing I requested, please, you have the budget, please buy me this book. Hmm. And going through it, I get to learn a lot and I get to be exposed to a lot that I wished I was exposed to many years before. And I wish that every other upcoming type designer is exposed to this level of information. And, and this is what I'm trying to wonder around. Like, what do we need to do for, for this knowledge coming out of reading? If we're gonna talk about Arabic script specifically. Well, I know you you don't want to keep it regional or specified to any specific. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm very happy to talk about that. Uh, and um, 
I'm also happy to talk about Arabic because again, I cannot claim, uh, the only affinity I can claim to any uh, version of Arabic is friendships with people representing different flavors of it. Uh, so I tend to associate uh, <laughs> different uses of Arabic with different cuisine or different jokes or different experiences I've had with people. But I, I, I try to approach it as neutrally as possible. Uh, I'll make uh, two points that all of the people who have come to Reading, almost none of them has had a background of education that was, say, in history, in anthropology, in geography, some that was core humanities disciplines that would train you to do this. Yeah. Uh, almost all of them had what you would think of as design backgrounds. And they are the same people who, during their year, uh, learned how to do research in a specific way, and then we were able to produce uh, these first statements of research, which were the dissertations, which a lot of them are stellar pieces of work. Others are evidence of people building skills that they didn't even think they would have. And then a lot of them, uh, when funding allows, go on to produce PhDs that are genre-defining uh, for our field. Uh, from a design background. So for me, this gives me two points. One is a confirmation that actually you cannot dream up how to do research on your own. This is one of the, like I cannot dream up engineering on my own, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you really need a structured environment of study. You need people to build specific skills. You need a specific kind of feedback and so on. At the same time, Anybody with motivation and intellectual curiosity can do it. Uh, and I should note that almost all of the people that have come through Reading have English as a second language. Yeah, That is actually quite important. We often neglect this, but this year is not different from pretty much any other year where I've got you know, 12 people, uh, 13 people from 13 countries. That That's the kind of diverse in the backgrounds that we have and we've got one native english speaker uh, and everybody else is building also language skills uh, at the same time so i think it's perfectly possible uh, i think uh, the structured environment gives the opportunity for people to accelerate very quickly their skills and i think that's the purpose of it uh, we are putting a lot of work in alternative ways of delivering this i've got a two-year blended learning program which has produced so far stellar results uh, with research for people who are doing most of the work online um, uh, people from as far as australia uh, and malaysia uh, as well as europe uh, working on this uh, and they only spend a few weeks over the two years at trading but they work on building research skills at a higher level so i think it is possible to do this and we're extending this further. Uh, it's a specifically blended two-year program, only part-time, only for people who are doing it mostly from afar. So I think it is possible to do this. Uh, but the important thing is that we are taking apart the idea of what a designer is in many environments where people think design is just something that makes things pretty. Uh, but the design is someone who has the skills to ask questions about the environment and say, how do these things happen? How do these uh, lettered signs or these printed signs or these things that appear on my device appear here? Uh, what technology brings them here? What influences? And how do I respond to them? And be aware of also how the, the act of doing, the process of doing design also feeds into a cycle. Uh, before going more in Arabic, I'll say something specific about Titus' thing. That, what you mentioned, though, I had to go to an institution and ask them to buy a book that cost, I don't know, 130 euros or something. For me, that's a failure because that is uh, a nominal three years of full-time work for someone to produce research that is important. They generate a new knowledge and then there's a paywall uh, by an, a publisher uh, who says only institutions can get it because you can't spend 130 euros to buy a book. Uh, so there are many ways in which the system of academic production of knowledge is broken and things are not by default uh, free. Uh, 
especially in environments. This unfortunately doesn't apply so much in the UK, but the environments where education is free and is supported with public funding, I think there's an, there should be an automatic assumption that any knowledge generated by researchers should be available immediately. Uh, Arabic for, for me uh, is a very interesting case uh, of a gradual realization by communities that influence Arabic, but are perhaps not native to Arabic or only partially native to Arabic, uh, understanding the complexity of the script. So Arabic, again, is a bit is like Latin script. It sort of doesn't belong to anyone. It is shared by many communities in many geographies from Western Africa all the way to Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, there's communities in China writing in Arabic. Uh, there's communities in Central Africa writing in Arabic, and the script, of course, looks very different from region to region because the historical development was different, the tools were different, the languages were different, the, the trade routes that provided resources were different and influences. Uh, Borna Izatpana's uh, recent PhD uh, traced the... I have my hand on it. it, it it's a, an incredible piece of work, but it shows you how the earliest forms of Persian printing happened in India. Uh, that might not fit very well with people's narrow ideas of association of a language and a specific uh, culture and ethnicity and so on with a geography, but it is historical reality in its all, its all its complexity and its beauty because it shows us all how the world we live in is much more fluid and interconnected. So. If you're thinking about Arabic, you're thinking, well, what is this Arabic thing? What's the character to where? Uh, how does the Arabic that we arrive at reach our screens or our, the newspaper in front of me and so on? You mentioned Titus where he was dealing with a very specific technology, but if you're looking at digital representations of the script, who made the decisions? Yeah. Then, and I have the, I'm repeating discussion I have sometimes with students, but unless you understand the years of early computing developments in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, when the infrastructure of what we are dealing with now were put in place, which all happened in the West Coast of the United States, yeah. then actually you're, you're essentially just talking into the air because there were communities of people who developed patterns of thinking for specific environments and with the limitations of their environments there that influenced then generations of makers and also multiple other scripts. The same way Gutenberg's metal type, which worked okay for black Latin, was adapted for Roman forms and then ended up being used for the type you have behind you, yeah. which was never, was never part of the brief. Right, the, yeah, no. the brief, the brief, you know, the brief creep, you know, expanded yeah. along the way. And somebody says, "Oh shit, we need to do this kind of thing," and the the black bits connect. Yeah. And somebody says, "Well, we never thought we'd need to connect the things, so the system worked for, well. We need to hack it then." So if you say, "Who dreams up how to do Arabic in the seventies and eighties uh, in the west coast of the states? Who do you have access to if you're there? There's no internet." Mm -hmm. Right, there is no Wikipedia. There are no people to speak to. If you're lucky, you're next to a university like Stanford. You walk into on campus and say, "Guys, who speaks Arabic here? Yes. I need someone." Oh, we've got a scholar of Arabic. Okay, what does a scholar of Arabic mean? Is it someone who is studying the medieval Arabic scholars traditions of? Uh, Maybe, but maybe for them also Arabic is a secondary language. Yeah. But also they might be studying. This certainly happened with uh, a lot of languages that had to do with uh, Cyrillic, Greek, and to some degree Arabic as well. The idea of what Arabic language is is different. It might be a historical form of the language or for very specific scripts. And all of the sacred texts, and by sacred, I mean the Quran as well as Al Ghazali, are uh, very monotone scripts. You know, the, the author starts speaking and there's yeah. no list, there's no tables, there's no complex diagrams and so yeah. on. So the typography can also be simple. And then that you can represent somehow some technology, that form of the script of implementing one language that you're studying doesn't mean that you've covered everything. And we see the same thing 
uh, with uh, other scripts. You no, know, it's very so very easy to see how uh, pretty much everything developed just for not even English, American. It's a it's a simplified form of the English language in its literate expression. Really doesn't work for Central European languages for decades until yeah. people start hacking it. For Arabic, it's the same thing. So if you are representing Persian and you have no representation at the point that decisions are being made, then your language documentation becomes part of that brief creep that happens 20 years later, where Unicode 3, 4, 5 has been in the books, and then everything else gets in more slowly. Uh, what if you are representing you know, Western African ways of writing, or uh, even more difficult, uh, minorities within their larger communities. Yeah. So uh, the Arabic uh, use of Arabic in China is a very good case, where it's a minority, uh, also within a dominant culture that very much doesn't want uh, to empower minority identity through its typographic representation there getting your the way you use the script onto the system that you are tied into actually becomes a Herculean task. And I think uh, simple questions like what is Arabic as a script uh, is actually a very interesting point. Then we see a lot of decisions. And this is one of the uh, key rules in typography that I think Arabic suffers a lot from. Uh, and again, I say all these things, these are my view, of what I've learned through my reflection all these years, but again, I'm happy to be shot down for this. Uh, that limitations from one technology get passed on to the next one and often the next one uh, much more easily than they are undone. So we might have uh, digital platforms that think of individual letters that have spaces around them because the concept of a letter as sitting within a rectangle of space that is handled by the machine is embedded in our thinking. And the first engineers who did it said, oh, we're translating this bit that we found in phototype setting. But that was copied as a paradigm from hot metal, which was copied as a paradigm from it. And then you have now a digital letter form that is a font that might look at the digital bounding box. But I don't need this thing. Yeah. I've just got... I've just, I might say I've got black bits or I have white bits if I've got a dark mode environment increasingly, that I just need to arrange themselves. I don't need the concept of side bearings or uh, a fixed character width for it. I might just need rules about how things connect to the next bit in line yeah. Yeah. and so on. So for Arabic, we're in the position where at some point somebody said, we've got this test case, this sort of this, uh, uh, our comparator, which is uh, manuscripts, and specifically the Quran, which is a very formalized way of representing the language. And it's a great thing to have that because it says, this is, you need to be able to do this. Uh, and then you might have levels at which you approach this and are acceptable and are not. So something maybe is for a newspaper, which is an ephemeral document, is informal and so on, might be allowed to be very away from this. And that's okay, because I know yeah. I'm going to just read and throw it away. The same way Instagram Arabic might be not very good, but it's okay, I'm just reading about some guy who fell while skateboarding, right? Yeah. Uh, but not if I need literature, poetry, or then the Quran and so on. So th there's a dial there of supporting the script, which is very different if I'm doing ephemeral, if I'm doing informal language, if I'm doing essays, poetry, literature, sacred texts, and so on. Uh, and there are very clear levels when you do this. So at some point, uh, you can see simplified Arabic that says maybe, oh, for those kind of texts, I can do this, and that will work okay. For those people in, who are using Arabic script who are actually paying me to develop the system. That's quite important again, because Central African Arabic was not a newspaper market. They didn't get a say in the yeah. development of that. Yeah. Uh, and then you have a slow growing of complex of systems and maybe you can say, oh, actually this script has, the scribbles change shape as you write them. 
well, you think, oh shit, that's a problem because our machine is not designed to do this. How do I deal with this thing? Uh, what do I do? I need multiple shapes for, for what connects to something depending on what's it. Okay, how do I deal with this? You get the engineer next to you and he says, you know what? If I do an analysis of the manuscripts, I get you know, 15 different forms for each pair of letters or triple of letters. You can do yeah. triple forms. Uh, our technology cannot do this. And we're talking now things about you know, 50 years ago. Uh, maybe our technology, if we push it, can deal with three. I'll give you initial, middle, and final, and that would be good enough to trick the readers into thinking that this is competent enough to do maybe literature, to do poetry, and so on. Yeah. And then you produce it because maybe people will say, you know what? I can see it's not great, but I have a newspaper. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or I can yeah. print. I can print school books. Yeah. Like I can actually educate children because at no point was there a grand committee of the people who use the Arabic script who got around the big table and said, we will be happy with just three forms per letter form. Initial media, no, that's nonsense. It was just an expediency for, because of technological limitations at the time that technology was much more hampered than it is now. If we were look, doing through the same thing now, let's say sitting with a blank sheet of paper and said, we've got the digital technology that we wanted to reproduce a script that has a built-in complexity in the way the forms respond to the one before and after them. I might find that I need seven forms for Arabic. Maybe I need two or three initial forms, two or three final forms, and three or four medial forms. Yeah. With our technology now, that's perfectly doable if I want to do it that way. Or you might do a deconstructive approach, uh, like Dekotai, which says, I don't care about individual forms, I care about strokes. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, so the whole convention of initial, middle, and final, the way I perceive uh, things, is a convention that is due to technological limitations from previous times, previous technologies, that just got carried over. Because yeah. whenever you sell a system, it's very difficult to sell a new system. You sell something that does what the previous system did, but a bit more cheaply or more efficiently. And people are conditioned to think about this. Also, I've got already, you know, phototype Arabic with initial, medial, and final. It's easy to convert these to, say, type 1 digital. I'll do that. Hey, hey, I've got a library ready. I don't need to redesign everything from scratch, which is much more difficult and I don't have time to do it. Yeah. And at the time, maybe research environments are where this thing can happen. But at that time, this wasn't really the case. So if you want to rethink formats specifically for Arabic, that would be interesting. Uh, it is, in my mind, a real um, misfortune globally that the platforms we are using for typography were developed for the most simple form of one of the easiest scripts to typeset. True. It's not only a, a phonetic script with separate forms, because uh, Cyrillic is more complex than, uh, than Latin for English. Greek is way more complex. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a West Coast idea of what English is. And that is the simplest use case. And then we take this and we want it to work for Arabic around the Indian scripts, where you might have conditional rules that even jump across the, the word. Uh, it would be so much better if the dominant forms for typesetting had been developed by a Persian, yeah. because then they would also have thought of a non-horizontal stacking of uh, exactly. characters. Exactly. If a Chinese system had been developed, then we wouldn't have this fixation from left to right and then hack everything. We would have also thought, oh, it could be left to right, it could be right to left, it could be top to bottom. Yeah. Because Chinese historical practice has all of these things. And there, there are interesting historical reasons during uh, Mao's regime that were forcing the Chinese to shift for certain documents from left to right, simply in order to adopt Western technology, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but it is a misfortune that we are, now that we are opening up 
typographic research and discussion that we're trying to essentially reclaim the complexity uh, of, of a lot of scripts and reveal it in a way that the people who make the platforms that we're using uh, can actually implement these things. This is not happening at the pace that it should. Yes. Because, and, yeah. Yeah, because like, I just wanted to add something because um, in, 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 um, in the time that I, I realized that all these inherited limitations, technological limitations, been, been happening through the years. And maybe a hundred years ago or more than a hundred years ago when, when Arabic was first introduced to Linotype, there was, yeah, there was like all these technological limitations. Arabic had to squeeze itself to work within this. Uh, but again, the general reader was still having a more solid relationship with the traditional Arabic, with the manuscript uh, copyist work, with the calligrapher work. While now, in the current time, this relationship would between, between a reader and traditional Arabic is not necessarily solid with the whole globalization and mm. like westernized styles being more common. And not every type designer in the current time will have the same accessibility to be working alongside an engineer to help him, which which would be fortunate with me for me when I work and I have Khaled on my side, Khaled Hosni, very helpful. Whatever I want to do is there to like uh, help me engineer it. Or when Borna is working on an Astalik uh, typeface and he has an engineer to work with him also to help him with all this complexity. A general practicing type designer is not going to necessarily have accessibility to an engineer or to the knowledge an engineer has to do all the hacking needed to fix this. And and, and this is where I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the importance of the relationship with the manuscript for the designer and for the reader himself. Because this, this unaccessibility to manuscripts, to archives, alongside the limitation of the technology itself or the limitation we are inheriting from the technology, this is what can end up producing some um, Frankenstein uh, scripts, like some some weird misrepresenting mm -hmm. letter form. Mm -hmm. and, and I have a fear for this. Uh, okay, there, there's, there's a couple of points there. One, it has to do with how do we uh, make sure that we get knowledge to people. Uh, the other has to do that the world is changing in a way where we are all becoming at least bilingual and biscriptal, I think, in our consciousness. Uh, yes. Certainly, outside Europe, people are biscriptal. So you go into pretty much any environment and you will see people who are in the services sector, people are in design, people are professionals, and they will use, uh, they will consume also some culture that is this global international, unfortunately, very heavily influenced from the United States. I think this is uh again a particular aberration in global culture yeah uh, i'll get to this in a bit because my view is probably slightly um controversial in this uh but i think the fact that people my generation grew up in essentially monocultures where you would rarely hear or speak another language and we are operating in an environment with me sharing a room with people from 13 different countries is yeah whatever this is normal uh, or to go to places where two, three, four languages spoke at the same time. And I think this is normality. That I think will also be reflected in the kind of design we see, not least because we are sharing many more environments in which we see design. So Instagram uh, doesn't allow you to do the things that you would want to do. Uh, I saw that at some point, one of the participants was a researcher, but who is looking at the problems uh, of representing Urdu uh, in Instagram. Yeah. Uh, and that applies in many environments where people might um, sort of uh, tr try to find alternative ways of essentially typesetting what they want to say in order to achieve the complexity they do. So there's still a lot of way to go from there. Uh, again, I think there's a disconnect there similar to English. Uh, I will say this, 
I speak for myself. I do not represent my employer or anyone in this view. Uh, but the same way that the typographic technologies that we use were developed by a extremely well-meaning, you know, very forward-looking people who were working with a very limited set of resources uh, and a very specific viewpoint of that of North American, West Coast English, perception of what the world is in the 70s and 80s, uh, historically and culture and everything. The same way, the fact that the global popular culture is predominantly North American for me is a problem yeah. because uh, the United States is a very interesting aberration in world history. It is a product of the Enlightenment, which is a wonderful experiment by people who left Europe behind, were themselves escaping persecution, uh, built a, uh, a new say, community in a Nom practically endless land with resource based on genocide. So they sort of eliminated all the Native Americans there practically, uh, erased the past. So this is historically a completely novel scenario. We almost don't have anywhere else somebody landing in a land and then saying, we've got a blank slate, let's build a state. So the yeah. original founding documents of uh, the United States are amazing texts, literally of people sitting around the table saying, we're going to build a new state. How do we do this? At the time of monarchy, because Europe at the time was, in the, uh, was uh, an entirely monarchical uh, continent. So you have this uh, very interesting uh, experiment in nation building that comes on almost the negation of historical depth. Yeah. So you're in the United States and someone says, this is old, and they mean 150 years old. And for me as a Greek, if it's got three digits, it's not old. <laughs> yes. It's old when you're counting in the thousands. <laughs> when the same thing happens, if I ever manage to go to Iran and somebody says old, I know we're talking about the same thing because for them, old is no three, 4,000 years old. The same thing in China, the same thing in India. Uh, but that is the reality of most of the world where historical depth is different, where the complexity of depth is different. If I go to the Balkans, which is probably the most intense geography in terms of overlapping histories and narratives, uh, three, four religions all together fighting at the same time for centuries, then the idea of old, of traditions, of relationships to authority, of uh, ideas of social structures that determine what language you speak to whom and how, these things are much more complex than something that is represented by the global culture we, we, we consume. So I do have this supposition, and to the degree that I can understand the culture that's consumed in India and in uh, China that interests me, uh, I think it is different that the popular culture in an environment where you have thousands of years of depth is different. It has nuances, it has complexities, it has some sort of accommodation with periods of history where things change that are more open to this kind of discussion than the very simplistic, uh, essentially poet 20th century. Uh, nothing from the United States in global terms uh, matters uh, before uh, the American Civil War. That's when the United States really begin to come in. Yeah. Maybe the War of 1812, if I'm generous, right? Uh, but only then do we really begin to see a, a global presence culturally. But for me, this is an aberration because this is like the footnote to what I consider history of a culture. Uh, and that has its impact in typography. Because when I say Arabic, what does Arabic mean 700 years ago, 1200 years ago? What's the Arabic of the medieval scholars in different regions? How do migrant communities that travel throughout uh, the northern region of Africa, Middle East, and so on, change their language and their practice? That has to have an impact to what is going on today. And if we fail to include this in our considerations, I think they're missing a big point. So the closing requirements for people maybe to, to expect not to find very good answers very quickly, but to slow down and 
to give typography and typeface design the respect it requires by allowing themselves uh, to reflect, to learn, to read, to build expertise, to see that maybe this is something that is sufficient to give you a lifetime of learning, uh, instead of expecting that within three years you will be an expert. Yeah. I, mean, I would, I would dread to call myself an expert in anything. I've been in this in this gig for thirty years, so if I'm honest, I'm only beginning to get it. Only now in my 50s, am I beginning to have a sense, oh, I sort of know what, what's going on and maybe I can have a view that is worth paying attention to. Uh, and I think it took me over 20 years to really understand how typography functions within a society. Uh, so I think people giving themselves time to understand all the factors and see things, their complexity and see all kind of learning as conditional, uh, is a good starting point. Yeah. But you were really touching on, 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 on really important points. Not sure which one to pick to pick to start from now. Uh, is it is it like is it the complexity of where the technology itself is coming to us from? Or to talk more about the conditions of this globalization while while it's really something definitely special about this time and and we can enjoy a lot of its facilitation it's allowing me to talk to you through all these like distance and land and and all that but also it's it's definitely re reflecting a certain challenge for scripts because the ground is not equal either mm -hmm. like we are yes we are definitely by scriptural like it's like everywhere, like everywhere that is not the states now, at least. Like if I'm talking about my region, it's very common that people are either talking Arabic and English or Arabic and uh, Arabic and French and English. That's that's very common. And but in the same time, the ground on which you are developing scripts or type actually uh, for for these scripts is not is not equal at all. You have very dominant uh, visual culture due to globalization for what I would call the West, maybe. This is like mm -hmm. very, uh, uh, yeah, like, like as, a, as a label. And you have a lot of technological uh, limitations that you would go through if you're going to be designing for, for, for Arabic. And on top of this technological limitation, there is also a limitation related to being able to understand and dig into the history of, of, of this script. And it will be the case for many others if we're not only gonna be talking about Arabic, actually. So how do you see this bi-scriptual uh, uh, relationship evolving in the future? Like how, how, like, what do you think should be done or how do we, how are we going to keep seeing it? I think there is a, a risk there for especially smaller communities. Uh, I say this again, the West is a slightly, it's an old form and it sort of made sense when we, for those of us who remember the Cold War, when you might be thinking of the East and the West or you know, uh, uh, as West as NATO. I think that uh, affiliation is pretty much useless as a term now. I would think more of the Anglophone North uh, with maybe some affiliated cultures like Australia, perhaps, and so on. To some degree, Canada. Canada is not really very prominent. Uh, but in Europe, you can find a lot of cultures that are smaller countries. Uh, if you're Slovak, if you're Czech, uh, any any one of you know if you're Slovene, uh, a lot of these kinds are so small that actually they don't have enough of a critical mass of consumers of users, uh, not necessarily enough uh, designers developers who are internationally networked to represent their language or the cultures. Uh, so it is much more difficult. So it is maybe easier for someone representing Polish culture to be seen 
because there's 15 typeface designers from Poland, at least that are having international careers, but there's maybe two from Slovenia, three at most. Uh, and that is something that shows this complexity that even in what we think of as the developed world, uh, you have these communities that might be struggling and internally you might see differences say in different regions of Spain. Or if you look at small countries like Greece, uh, where nobody in the right mind would, learns Greek. So if you are Greek and you want to have any kind of success in your life, you have to learn English. You have to willfully become bilingual. You have to connect internationally because all the work will be like that. So therefore you are yourself uh, either undermining the integrity of your culture or you are contributing to this development of this hybridization. Yeah. Uh, so in the Arabic world, you, I think you need to paint different pictures from, for smaller communities uh, or communities within larger environments. Uh, so you cannot tell the same story for Kuwait as you can for Iran. Um, because in Iran, you have enough people you have <laughs> talking about them. You have a large enough community that regardless of the conditions, of exchanges and so on. There's enough universities, there's enough scholarship, there's enough people. So there is no intrinsic threat to the culture. Uh, whereas from a small country, this is what we see a lot in the Emirates, uh, these entities, this political entity cannot really exist on their own uh, other than as hubs of exchange with others. So there, what is an Emirati national identity is a much more complex problem. And I think people, if they don't think consciously about this, uh, then essentially they forfeit the development to these powers of the larger cultures that will just steamroll through. Uh, I think we see this process very much uh, in India with minorities trying to uh, establish some foothold against Modi's uh, pure Hinduist uh, inspired culture. We can see the same thing in China and also in the region where you have smaller countries and they've got China and India around them and they're thinking, well, I need to find a way somehow to exist in this region without being steamrolled by these two superpowers. Yeah. Uh, so I think that stuff matters. I mean, as a footnote, Korea has played this nicely. Um, if you track the the soft power of K culture, that is a way of addressing this. It's a very smart way of ensuring uh, the continued presence of a culture. What is actually a small country? South Korea is a really small country which was completely destroyed uh, after the after the, the proxy war. It suffered and had to rebuild, be rebuilt from scratch, very successfully on certain criteria, and uh, they found a way of arming their culture with a visibility that is way above the scale of their population. So I think there's an interesting uh, lesson there. Uh, I don't think there is going back and I don't want us to think about going back. I, I, uh, I have zero uh, nostalgia uh, for monocultures. The as someone who remembers how difficult it was to meet people from other environments before, uh, the opening up of Europe and before travel became easier before the internet. I really hated that kind of thing. We were all living in small islands. That's not a healthy environment to live in. The more we interact with others, the healthier our outlook. Uh, and I see the, the current problems that we're experiencing uh, due to the limitations of travel as a useful reminder of what we're missing. The fact that I cannot meet people uh, new people or feed my network all around the world. I'm leaving the environmental issues aside in this, but the fact that uh, this makes me feel I am part of a global network of people who are working together. And I think you cannot go back from that. This is uh, a way that we need to think for. So way we could think, how do we do this that is sustainable? Uh, how do we produce any kind of activity that we do with a mind to open documentation. Uh, some projects exist for this. Um, some have been funded. Uh, I have to say there is uh, 
there is a little project uh, that was funded for a bit uh, by Google that due to my not being uh, good enough at keeping to the things I said I would is not live yet, but it would start exactly with this premise of opening up a platform for uh, research by students, researchers in a way that is accessible. Uh, okay, but that is something that dependent on Google funding something and on me finding the time, uh, which is not easy when I have a day job uh, and I'm not paid to do it. Uh, so uh, I think there are problems there. Uh, so we're still reliant on structures that are not necessarily from the ground up and we are building things that depend on these uh, very strongly integrated into our life platforms on which ultimately we have very little control over. Uh, so open source systems for exchange information that are not owned by a corporation that is driven by profit, by but might be community resources and so on, the equivalent of Wikipedia. It's a wonderful model that it still survives. Uh, those are much better ways of doing things. Uh, and I think we should be trying to do these things, putting effort in translating resources. Uh, scholarship is, there's this massive elephant in the room of scholarship in English, uh, and then very little of it that is translated from other languages into English and from English into other languages, because you may have someone who speaks Arabic well enough to go to a conference, but they might not feel confident enough to write or translate their Arabic text into English or translate from, uh, and that's a different level of language skills. Uh, so there we do need processes that allow people to do this, maybe some sort of editorial filtering or crowdsourcing of some uh, text and so on. So you could have, what are the key texts that someone would need to know to understand the history of typography in Egypt? Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, put in a program that we might start translating some stuff and so on. At the same time, uh, you do need to have actions to convince people locally of the kind of stories that you need to tell. They have to do with uncovering archives, but also looking at ephemera. Archives are a very good resource for the things that people thought were worth keeping. Uh, and, and I say this very intentionally. Uh, Reading is an exception in archival cultures because it tends to collect ephemera also. Things like newspapers, advertising, papers, and so on. That is not normally what is being collected. Those yeah. are specialist collections. Mostly people collect the proper texts. You'll find collections of poetry and high literature and philosophy and religion and so on, but you might not find the scribbles that people make uh, on the sides of walls, graffiti, uh, lettering, protest posters, and so on. These things might be maybe collected, but they're not very easily accessible. Certainly, they're not the first things to be digitized, and that stuff matters a lot. Uh, and often, it is this that is more, uh, it is better at revealing the true expression of the script in a community because it is more informal, it is direct, it uh, evolves very quickly to reflect how people use it and so on. Where something that is printed uh, is limited by the technology. So if you get a technology for typesetting a newspaper, you don't throw it out after five years. You just, you, your investment needs you to keep using it for 10, 15 years. Exactly, yeah. So you are, and the system that you bought 10 years ago also needed another five years before it to be developed. So you're like, it's like the airplane are flying it is a 30 year old technology, essentially. Uh, and the same thing happens with typography. But if I go and look at the scribbles that people make on the sides of walls or a hand rendered uh, posters of protest, or if I look at what kind of lettering people do uh, on Snapchat or Instagram, or when they intervene, themselves with scribbles on top, that's where I can begin to understand a bit more what's happening. Uh, especially if I have environments that are not very uh, maybe permissive, 
uh, either for technological reasons or political reasons, then if I, I have to try to find how the subversion and protest express themselves. And there I can maybe find something that is closer to a true snapshot of how the script is used at that time, because it will be done outside the normal channel of typesetting documents. So if I take a picture and draw on it and then take a picture of it and post it on Twitter, Twitter doesn't know that this is a text mostly, or it tries yeah. to, yeah? yeah. Uh, and I might be able to fool it. And then that shows me how far I can modify the script, uh, but it's still readable. So it, it, it might work uh, that way, yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I don't know, I'm really inspired by our conversation today. We really, uh, maybe this is just the beauty of time. It just took us from everywhere, from like <laughs> politics to geography and geopolitical understanding of the world. It actually, and 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 I'm very great grateful for this. And okay, but 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 it it's boring, right? If if we just look at the letters, they're boring. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can I, I, can, I, I can just now. I can just get uh, some typefaces, digitize them maybe pay some people to extend them any way I th they think is okay or I think is okay and call it Noto or call it, uh, <laughs> you know, Universe de Vanagari, which is an aberration. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm not going into that. Um, <laughs> or lightness. And I, people still read it and that's super boring. But if I say type is that the intersection of politics, of history, of culture, of language, of identity, of generational conflict. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Uh, next year, he's going to hate me for saying this, because, yeah, next year, a wonderful PhD uh, by Mohamed Dakak will, uh, will be submitted, which is looking at exactly type preferences for Arabic uh, for native readers across different styles of Arabic, across different kinds of documents. Uh, and there you will see differences uh, in different genres of text, but also generational differences. Mm -hmm. So wow. my, my perception of what typography is, is very different because my formative years were based on paper-based documents. And the same thing would apply to any person who is native to Arabic that is of my generation. They grew up reading a you know, piece of paper. So they are thinking of spines and ends of pages and so on. But someone who's 25, these things are you know, their parents' way of thinking about the language. And they grew up reading things that have pages, but not spreads. Yeah. They don't necessarily have back pages and they have endless depths. Yeah. So completely different understanding. I think it's a completely different, completely different understanding. So yeah. the gen we are at the stage where the generational differences between those who learned to to read, to consume, and form their, you know, the, your first, say, 20, 20 odd years, uh, if they were mostly analog, you have a very different conception of typography than if you're the generation that were mostly digital. Yeah. Uh, and the interesting thing is that none of these younger people oh. is actually making any decisions at the moment. They are sort of too low in the hierarchy of decision making. So they're consuming. They might be doing some ephemeral piece of design or a bit of graphics and so on. They're not running their own companies yet. Yeah. They're not uh, chief engineers. They're not in a position to make big decisions. It will take them 10 years to do it. So there's always a delay. The people who are making big decisions are in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s. And their understanding or what they were exposed to is completely different than I think so. I yeah, think so. Yeah. That's, that's, that's why online newspaper. Yeah, that's why online newspapers so often still look like print equivalents. Yeah. Very, very few online newspapers don't look like print. Yeah. Uh, even if you think that, hold on, how do most of people read the, these media uh channels? They read something that is on screen they don't buy paper and of course that gives rise to alternative uh, news channels which the main newspapers might not think are a threat to them but eventually they become more uh, much more widely read because they are appropriate to the readership 
True. And, and their typography becomes then the normal typography for the readers. Yeah, that, that's very true, actually, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> I'm loving how, how this conversation is just taking us everywhere. I just want to invite everyone, if you guys, uh, with us and like, and from the participants, if you have questions, please uh, share them with us in, in the chat. That, that would be nice also. Um, I'm very thankful for this chance uh, that we got to talk today. And I really want to thank you for your time and, and, and for everything you're offering to, to, this, uh, to the community of type design also. Um, and hopefully we can get to meet again in person soon. I do that hope so. happen in a while. Maybe yeah, in the, the next year thing mm. in, in Canada, mm. that would be a really great chance. Yeah. Okay, we have a question now. Uh, Maurice is asking, I wonder if the structure of Northern universities are also a barrier to the expansion of knowledge generation, this mansion in type design yeah. as okay. elsewhere. Yes, uh, good question. Not from someone who knows higher education uh, intimately. Uh, there is an interesting uh, conflict in a lot of institutions. Uh, and I think this, you see a lot of uh, higher education institutions, universities that are publicly funded that tend to be teaching institutions. A lot of European institutions like that, a lot of uh, Eastern Mediterranean institutions like that. So they're essentially uh, educating people to be professionals and research is a very small part of their activity. That has to do with funding networks and so on. Uh, in the UK, you see a division between research intensive institutions uh, like Reading and other institutions that are not research intensive. The problem with the research institutions is that they have a very different funding model. So the fees are high. Uh, they depend a lot on what funding streams they will get in order to fund this research. Uh, so it's not seen as a public good, this research. Uh, there's money diverted to the funding council, but it tends to go into science, technology, engineering, and so on. So we still have this division between what uh, political authorities think is good to fund. We want to fund medicine because it gives us vaccines. We don't necessarily want to fund culture because no, it's a time of crisis. We'll think about this when uh, we're in comfortable years. Uh, in the United States, again, you see a similar division between well-endowed institutions that can fund research and so on, but you see the problem even more acutely there of design coming up from a tradition of being taught in colleges and not discipline that research intensive institutions would produce. So in relation to the size of the education market in the United States, the amount of proper research that is happening in typography is laughable uh, because it's not seen as part of what these institutions are supposed to be doing in design. Uh, it's slowly changing. Uh, 15 years ago, all the job ads or promotion uh, specifications would essentially list client work. Uh, and what we've started seeing a lot more is expectations of some publications, exhibitions, some kind of research and so on, which is a good thing. But again, it takes time because these people that will be hired need to give, be given time and education is slow to produce the research, to publish, and also reach the points of authority in their hierarchies that allow them to just shift this institution. The situation is more interesting uh, in environments where design is already happening within research intensive institutions. I mentioned uh, Colombo before, the University of Moratua uh, is such an institution. Uh, Chula Longhorn in uh, Bangkok is such an institution. Uh, there's very serious design studies uh, in Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing. Uh, and so on. So these institutions have research into their DNA. So then the design schools, they have produced some kind of research. Uh, there might be different interpretations of what that research is, uh, but it is happening. Uh, to the degree that I have seen uh, some stuff from uh, 
universities in the Arab speaking world, there is a younger generation of educators that are also doing this. Uh, there's some interesting people in Beirut, there's some interesting people in Cairo uh, who are producing research. You can see some master's thesis, uh, master's dissertations that have research components in them, uh, and this is growing. Uh, and I think the, I, I plugged an event earlier, that these kind of networks are because uh, these people have this kind of awareness about research, about bringing new influences in. Education does move very slowly. So if I say I want to build a new program, it takes you two years to at least to run it through accreditation. And then if you're bringing a new master's program, you need three or four years to iron out issues in the, the program, the you're into six years. If I then want to do PhDs, uh, I'm looking into essentially a decade long program. Uh, because I need to train the master's graduates to be my PhD candidates, and then I need three or four years for the first PhD. Uh, that means that you need someone who will say, I'll give a decade of my career to have, uh, let's say, Beirut-based PhDs in typography, Cairo-based PhDs in typography, Kuwait-based PhDs in typography, and so on. So then you need uh, that as a career option you need you know, the University of Sarja to say, we will uh, support someone who wants to build this strand and see it, as, see it favorably when they apply for promotion, that they will have built this program and so on. So you need this combination of someone who is willing to take the risk and invest time and thinking in it. And you need the, the top-down environment that will say, yes, we'll support you and then you can do it. So there are cases where people are doing these things. Uh, I mentioned uh, Bangkok and Colombo and so on and Cairo and Beirut. Just, and I'm forgetting people, I'm sure, uh, with, with apologies. Uh, and those tend to be places where there is some confluence between an individual or a small team of individuals of the drive uh, and a, an environment uh, that supports this. A very good example of this is Portugal, which 15 years ago was just doing design as craft. Uh, and there was a big rethinking of uh, design education as a discipline. And the government put money into supporting part-time PhDs. So a lot of people who were teaching in Portugal, uh, you know, one, two, three days a week or something, uh, were funded to do part-time PhDs. And this was like almost like a 10 year program. Uh, but by the end of that program, you had a body of 30 somethings, 40 somethings who had teaching experience and had built research skills yeah. uh, on native subjects. Uh, so digging into archives, looking at the regional differences in practice. So the complexity of Portuguese printing history. And they themselves then uh, continued as the teaching and research staff in their institutions uh, and that enabled the environment to change uh, I see Yara uh, <laughs> there in the I mentioned Beirut because I was thinking of her yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it takes time you might want something and you can't do it in a year it, it takes several years to build something up yeah thank you for the detailed answer to the question mm. anyone else has any questions to share with us please uh, come along and, and i hope i really hope that um <laughs> like, <laughs> it's okay uh, yeah. the, the talk is recorded and i will be <laughs> i'll be sharing it with you very shortly like in a couple of days but it's okay <laughs> Uh, but I, I really still hope that we can see uh, a, a, a master's study program uh, somewhere in, in, in North Africa, Swan area. Like, I, like... Uh, of course we should. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't. Uh, I mean, there, is, there are good people. Uh, there are institutions that understand this. There are large populations that are interested in this. So yes, there are. Um, there's, 
Uh, Marrakesh, for example, produces very interesting work. They have collaborations with Zurich and Beirut and so on. So the, the networks are there. They yeah. don't need to yeah. pass through, through what I do. Uh, but uh, I, I'm absolutely certain that there will be. Uh, I think the trick for all of these things is not to see them as local events. So if you want to set up a, a master's in Cairo or Beirut, don't do it as an Egyptian or as a Lebanese master's. Do it as something that is for the yeah. whole of the Eastern Mediterranean. Yeah. Uh, make it something that is open to Turks and Greeks and Egyptians and Syrians and everybody in the region. And I really mean everybody uh, to come and say, yes, uh, let's start building regional programs at least. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think only the inclusivity of, of thinking um, about this would only make it uh, uh, successful. And, and I, I am certain also that this is something that will be coming soon. Like I can see between having more designers like and, 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 and more demand in, in the region, like even the economy of type making in the region is different now from 10 or 20 years ago. Um, so differently, or hopefully this will be translated in, in an academic way as well. I, I think so. I think so. And you also need the local network of agencies and local network of uh, publications or distinction or awards and so on. There is zero reason why, uh, say, a Middle Eastern uh, construction company should go to London to find an agency to do its brand for its building. That makes no sense. And it's sort of reverse <laughs> colonialism through the back door. It happens a lot. And I ask yeah. you the same question, why? Yeah. But... Yeah, but yeah. I think that tells you a lot about the culture and you can say, uh, I cannot really complain about the uh, importation of Western culture if I myself am going to London to hire an agent to do that instead of saying, actually, let me try to what skills do I need? Let me try to find these skills locally. If I'm missing something, then I go to find yeah. you know, the right kind of person and but bring them in to work with the local so that they build the know-how. Yeah. So, yes, you do bring someone in if you need to but once exactly so that then you can use them to educate uh, the local talent and then help that build up yeah yeah uh, so i find it uh, really frustrating that you see the massive construction that is happening in the gulf that is happening all by by british agencies yeah, really? Second, there, yeah. There, are, there are no there are no designers in the region that, that, that's definitely that's not, not. Yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. And it's it, it, it there's a lot of translations to it from like a very post-colonial uh, hmm. treat that that is, is very common through the region hmm. that investors or, or, or leaders would love to listen to a Western uh, design house than, than hire a local. Um, and it's it's uh, this happened a lot, especially yeah, in, in in the Gulf area and even in Egypt till now. But hopefully, this decreases in the coming years. Okay, but but, but that that's the starting point. You say okay, but why do they say want a, a Western person, or why do I want a Western type designer to come and show me how to do type and so on? And invite a uh, gray old white man to to show me, which has been done. Uh, <laughs> maybe say, say, what are the skills that I need? Yeah, find the right person for the skills, and how do I build them? Because that's not a sustainable way to just get someone in to just give me their uh, shine a bit of their their brilliance on me. That that osmosis is not a way of improving your skills. Uh, but if you say, oh, I want to build a sustainable community of excellence locally, do I need to build certain skills? Do I need to build resources? Do I need to get that person who is excellent in their field and get them to do a brain dump? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you started by Hera Dunger, quoting Hera Dunger. That's what that book is useful in. It's a brain dump of someone literally at the peak of their career, just before he died. And essentially, this is how I see typeface design for the bit that I can talk about. 
and he's he was sort of wise enough not to try to stray into other fields into other scripts which was great because this is this is what i can talk about this is a model for talking about i think i think i need to break it down into these chapters these maybe there's some more so then okay a sustainable way might be to fund someone who is a, a recognized uh, designer in their community to produce similar kinds of documents that then can be shared by teachers can be shared by students and so on what means well-designed arabic what is a well-designed nastalik what is a well-designed anything uh, we cannot just sort of wink and nudge at each other and say we know what we well we don't know what we mean yeah uh, maybe if we've grown up in the same community or we've gone to the same school because we got inculcated by a teacher to think in a specific way. But if I say, I need to explain to that engineer who is building an airport what a well-designed uh, typeface for signage that is designed specifically for Arabic or Arabic first. And I say, I mentioned Mohammed Dakak first, uh, his typeface Jali, which is out now, is a very good case in point. It's a wayfinding typeface designed for arabic first it has latin but it was designed as an arabic first typeface okay what are the skills that that typeface embodies why is it different from things that would be an interesting design challenge ideally then somebody closes themselves in a room with mo and just gets them to do a brain dump of yeah. the design challenge how they interpret and that is a very useful thing in the meantime you can also observe uh analyze the typeface itself uh, but there are now cases we're not where we were 20 years ago so maybe if 20 years ago someone would say oh i cannot find a designer experienced enough in airport signage uh, in the gulf or in egypt or wherever i don't think you can make that argument now it's just lazy exactly yeah yeah i i totally agree with you and uh as we are coming to the end of this new <laughs> chapter of the Zoom limitation, uh, I really want to thank you so much for your time today and for this very rich discussion. I really enjoyed it so much. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the questions and the patience of everyone uh, on the topic. I'm sure the couple of comments in the chats uh, will come to haunt me uh, later <laughs> in the week <laughs> no we really like i think everyone really enjoyed yeah. this so i really want to thank you so much for this and uh yeah hopefully we get to meet again soon i hope so yes a real pleasure yes it thank will be you. a pleasure thank you so much thank, thank you very you much everyone for being part thank of you thank you <laughs> goodbye bye